brought to you by Brass and Unity. We make wearable conversation starters. Our new buddy check packs are available now. Grab one and check on one of your closest buddies. They may need it now more than ever. Go to brassandunity.com, use the code UNITY and get 20% off. And let's all heal together. And brought to you by GFDA. Good fucking design advice. The voice in your head and the foot up your ass. GFDA makes prints, drinkware, and apparel for people who want to do their fucking best. Go and use the code UNITY and get 10% off now on anything on their site, including our collaborative product, Fucking Help Somebody. And brought to you by Daisy May Hat Co., the custom hat company based in Nashville, Tennessee. They make custom one-of-a-kind hats from wide-brimmed fedoras to cowboy hats. All of their hats are 100% beaver felt, and it's the highest quality hat you can get. They also have the coolest shirts ever. You can use the code BRASS at checkout for 15% off your entire order. Go and check out daisymayhats.com. Embrace the fever. Live the dream. And brought to you by Mindful Meds. You guys have been seeing me take Mindful Meds for a little while now. Mindful Meds is a premium supplement company dedicated to supplying humans with the tools to improve their mental health, clarity, and performance, all while supporting their growth along the way. Whether it's the Immunity Blend, Lion's Mane, Inspire, or Voyage, all of their products are clean, tested, consistent, and they've become a huge help in my life. I found Mindful Meds over a year ago now, and I've never looked back. Go check out their website, mindfulmeds.io, and use the code BRASS at checkout. Hey, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode. Dr. Deborah So is on the show. And if you are not aware of who this badass woman is, she is somebody who is breaking the mold by being willing to be brave enough to speak out against a lot of things that are going on in the world and speak out in a way that is not hateful, but is from an education standpoint and wanting to help others understand what is going on in this world. Because I got to tell you, I reached out to my buddy, Dan Holloway, and I was like, listen, I've never asked you for a connect, but I'm a risk it for the biscuit over our friendship. I need to talk to this woman. You need to get me in contact. And he was like, I got you. So welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. And thank you for being a voice. Thank you, Kelsey. It's great to be here. And shout out to Dan for hooking this up. Yeah, always. He's a good, uh, Dan's an interesting cat to say the least. (laughs) (laughs) So When I ran into him at SHOT Show this year, I walked right up to him and I said, hello. And then he made some joke about me being too short in person. And then I had to (laughs) graciously thank him for the, uh, for granting this awesome interview. I, um, I really wanted to have this conversation with you for several different reasons, mainly because in a world where our voices are being increasingly canceled, shut down, uh, suppressed, uh, shadow banned, you name it, there's a, there's a name for it on every platform. You seem to have broken through. And I would like to understand, number one, how you did it. Uh, And number two, I would like to understand what the hell is going on in this country that I currently reside. And I am so proud to be Canadian, but yet I am struggling day to day by staying in this country. Trust me, I know how you feel. Um, And I want to say thank you for your service as well, because I can't imagine I've said this to Dan, you know, people say fighting the culture war is brave. I think actually going to war, I cannot imagine what that's like. So I salute you for your courage. Thanks. And I'm really awkward. So open. <laughs> <laughs> I never know what to say. Speaking so honestly about, you know, your experiences and, and your experience with PTSD as well. So um, in terms of how to keep going, I, I mean, I, that's what I would just say. Just just keep going and know that if you know what your intentions are, like for me with my book, The End of Gender, and just even when I first started writing about the, the this issue about gender ideology and how science is being denied and how children and and even adults, their lives are being affected by this information being suppressed. People will call you all kinds of names, like hateful, transphobic, bigoted, anti-LGBT, anti-trans, all the rest of it. I know in my heart that that I'm not coming from a hateful place. And so it doesn't really matter to me what people say about me. It doesn't matter that I've been added to these hate lists. It doesn't matter to me that people who don't know me are going to judge me and might see that I'm on these hate lists or might see that my book was pulled or that I've been called this or that by some prominent person that they like or their friends. And they think that they have an idea of what I'm about without actually reading my work or listening to me speak. So I, I think that was definitely a process for me to come to a place where I was okay with that and I was at peace with that because it does hurt to think that people you don't know. I, I mean, I get messages from people who will say, my friend said that you hate trans people and then I actually read your book and I say that you're actually very sympathetic and you're very clear that you, you know, you're only doing this because you care about the community and you want to protect 
these kids from potentially making a bad decision. So I would say that's a big part of it. I think also just it is normal for us, especially in the internet age when you get so much harassment and it's so it can feel unending in, in mm -hmm. some cases. Take a break, you know, go get off of social media. And I would say, you know, a week later can make such a difference. I, I really do appreciate your words. It is increasingly more difficult as Canada has changed its laws. You've seen the the evolution since you've become a scientist and now a journalist and a writer. You've seen the evolution of what has happened with the the current and sitting administration over the past eight years, being somebody who's been an outspoken liberal. Uh, I find it fascinating to still hear yourself calling yourself a, a liberal after kind of seeing how the world has taken what it means to be a liberal spun it on its head and then spit out this really just tragic example of uh, separatist ideas and and uh, cancellations, uh, whether it's through because of business or whether it's through the way you speak or whether it's through science. I mean, so many people in Canada due to uh, these new bills, these new laws are losing are losing everything. I mean, B, uh, Bill C-11 went through this, uh, passed through the Senate House uh, this week in Canada, that's going to be increasingly more difficult. So I guess really what I'm getting to here with you is how do you see yourself moving forward, being a Canadian, trying to do the type of job you're doing? I just stay very focused for me personally on what my goal is. And I know that I just need to keep moving in that direction. And so I've, I have dealt with, I, I won't even get into the number of times I've experienced censorship. It's pretty outright. Um, definitely on social media, I would say, in terms in a variety of ways in terms of also how explicit it's been. So in some cases, you know, if you're shadow banned or if you just get this weird sense that people aren't seeing your posts because you're not getting as much engagement. I definitely think since Elon Musk has taken over Twitter, mm -hmm. uh, I've, things have gotten better, at least in my case, I would say so, which then makes you think, OK, so all of those things I noticed before was not me just being crazy. It right. was <laughs> and even though we were told that nothing was going on. Um, and then also, you know, you have, I would say professional, I would say on, on the professional side in terms of opportunities, having people distance themselves from you or offer you things and then take them away. And so, you know, I would just say it's hard. And like I said earlier, you know, it can be discouraging, but just to, just to keep going with it and to know that in this crazy world, there are other people who see it also, and just to find them and connect with them and and I do think still there's the majority of us are not okay with the things that are happening. And I still, I mean, I question sometimes, am I really, should I really still call myself liberal? Because I feel today's liberalism is encompassing more and more of leftism and these really extreme ideas and wokeism. I, I would, I've called myself a liberal just because I believe in freedom and I believe in, you know, I don't know. I've just always, I was previously very progressive, you know, <laughs> Right. and then progressivism. I don't know what happened. I would, I just say, you know, I, I stick to data. I stick to science and really that there's no political affiliation when you do that. So that right. maybe is a better description. I, it's funny though. Cause I, the reason I ask people these things isn't because I'm trying to give you this gotcha moment of like, I'm not a liberal. I'm not a conservative. I don't really know. It's, it's often to spark somebody else's thought because I do watch, I've seen you on these platforms. I think the first time I heard you was, uh, I heard about you was on Joe Rogan as so many probably did. My husband and I were listening to your episode and I kept yelling at the mic, like just being like, she, oh my God, she gets it. She gets it. She's explaining the uh, nuances that so many people do not understand because the wokeism movement that has happened to our culture and society has caused individuals to really not think at all. So there's no critical mm. thought that goes on. So I don't know that most people really believe what they say they believe. And so I start, I try to pry as to why do you call yourself a liberal anymore? Because it seems like more and more and more it's not that I see you going towards conservatism. I just see you backing science. And it feels like the liberal movement is really unwilling to look at science in the truest form, really trust truly what the science is saying. And when it comes to the science based in your book, I got to tell you, you have made the science digestible. What I love so much about your book, I love the audio, but I also love that you read it because there's something to be said about the way something is said with the tone in which it's said. And when you are reading a book or listening or are listening to a book like yours, context, tone, matter. And so the fact that you read it the way you read it, 
I think really illustrates and helps others find digestible pieces of information that they can really take and move forward with when speaking to family members, friends, or somebody in crisis. So can we talk about some of the science behind this? Because there is a difference between sex and gender, and there is a way to look at this. And I'd love you to illustrate what that is. Yeah, well, thank you so much for listening to the audiobook. I I felt it was really important for me to be the one to read it because it is my book and it is, they are my words. And I feel that, you know, I was also very particular in terms of how I wrote the book. I wanted it to convey the science in a way that someone who doesn't have a background in science or biology can easily understand it. And also because I understand that science can be very dry and it can be boring in some cases if you don't make it applicable to real life and you don't make it something a little bit more engaging. So yeah, I felt that was very important and to break it down in a way that parents could take it. I mean, the reason why I wrote the book is because I had been getting so many parents reaching out to me saying, my kids are being taught these weird ideas about gender. And I go and I talk to the principal or I speak with the administration and they tell us that the new, the newest, quote unquote, the newest science backs these ideas. And how do I, how do I counter that if, if that's what they're saying? So I wrote the book and I have all the citations and cite the studies so that parents can look it up for themselves and they don't have to take my word for it. And they can also take those studies to the administration. Although I feel since my book has come out, things have gotten so much worse than I ever thought they would, even in terms of just education alone. And I, I question even if, if a parent were to do that, to sit down and say, hey, you know, this is not actually based in, and these ideas that are being taught are not based in reality, that I feel in some cases the administration or the teachers would just basically do what they want anyway. So in terms of science and gender, or sex and gender, so sex refers to gametes. So this is whether we produce eggs or sperm. So sex is not a spectrum. There are two sexes, male and female. And then gender is how we feel in relation to our sex, our biological sex. So for 99% of us, more than 99% of us, our sex and our gender are in alignment. For roughly 600,000 people who identify as transgender, their gender is the opposite sex. And then now we have this non-binary trend, which has exploded in the last few years. There's no such thing as being non-binary. There are two genders, not millions and billions or however many <laughs> there are at this point. And... Um, it's really not that complicated. But yeah, in terms of education, I mean, it's kids are being taught that their sex is a spectrum, that just because there are people who are intersex, that that means that you're, anyone can be intersex. I mean, intersex, intersex people deserve bodily autonomy and rights, but it's not accurate to, to claim that sex is a quote unquote assigned at birth or that people don't know what their sex is. It could be a complete total surprise. You might think you're a man and it turns out you're a woman or you're intersex later in life. Um, that's not a very common experience. Um, like I said, that there are more than two genders there that's not based in science or that you pick your gender or that a boy who likes dolls is really a girl or a girl who likes trucks is really a boy or who knows what else. But yeah, I find that very disturbing. And then we also see, you know, th I, this touches a bit on the conversation about liberalism because, you know, for me, I'm straight. I grew up in the gay community. I spent so much time going to gay bars and drag performances. And I just, I am appalled to see that these types of events are being marketed toward children and this is the thing I feel liberalism has gone too far and that people are empathic people do want to advocate for acceptance this is not the way to do it I think this is really pushing things way in the opposite direction and it's going to lead to a backlash if anything okay so let's let's back up I can tell you for a fact teachers and uh administrations do not care what you bring forward to them, whether it's peer reviewed APA papers and you sit it down and you highlight and you bring it because I've done it and they don't care. Uh, they care about what the school board is telling them to care about, which is obviously I, I understand that you have a job, that job can be taken. I understand where it's going. That being said, when did it happen where all of a sudden adults stop being the thing that protect the children? When did we start being the ones that actively, uh, perpetuate harmful behavior. I'm What I'm trying to get to is why is it acceptable for us to allow all of a sudden children to go to drag events where grown men expose themselves in front of them? When did that happen? Because last time I checked, I'm a mother. Uh, you can't get me to bring my kid within 500 meters of that. We're harming children's psyche. I mean, I don't know if you ever watched Dr. Phil. 
when Dr. Phil oh. like first popped, right? You remember when Dr. Dr. Phil was on, oh, I, I got to sit beh beside this guy because most of my childhood, he would say quotes, right? He always had these little sayings that just kind of stuck. And one of them stuck for me. And it's still to this day, I swear by it. Stop putting adult problems on children minds like mm -hmm. it's not this is not rocket science mm -hmm. so why all of a sudden did it become acceptable for us to have grown adults exposing themselves grinding on children and go yep this feels right it's really exploded probably in the last year i would say but it's it's definitely been brewing for a long time and it's this idea that society i mean the underlying ideology is about trying to overturn social norms and trying to question what we consider acceptable push boundaries on what's considered acceptable for the sake of pushing those boundaries and so i can't speak to the intentions of the people holding these events but my sense is number one i would say for people in your audience i'm sure if there's anyone out there who is at all reluctant or feels badly about criticizing these types of events or any any type of sexualization of children, do not feel badly about that at all. Do not have any hesitation to do that and, and to call it out. And if you have a problem, especially with your kids and protecting your kids, don't ever feel badly because these events and th this ideology is very good at trying to emotionally manipulate people into thinking that if they are against them, that they are somehow a bad person or they are in favor of discrimination or that their their perspective should not be given weight because they are old fashioned or they're not whatever enlightened. Um, I, it, it disturbs me a lot, the things that I see and, and the fact that I think also that people are afraid to speak up about it. And then when you do speak up about it, it's crazy because then you see the media come to the defense of these people. And I will say in some cases, I'm sure it is grooming. I mean, I guess I can't really say that, but what it looks like to me is that if you have nudity, I mean, these are signs of grooming in terms of sexual mm -hmm. abuse of children, it, it, normalizing nudity around them, normalizing touch, especially in, in front of their parents, because then the child thinks that that is acceptable if your parents there and they're being touched by strangers. Um, so in terms of, I don't know, I, I that's all I get. I, can yeah. say. I get speechless when I think about it. Well, you know what, that's, that just, the reason I wanted to touch on this with you is because it's one thing when I'm over here ranting with no credentials to back behind the, my belief in this very simple thing, which is that children need to be protected, not abused. Children need to be monitored and, and, and cared for and explain, like we've always explained them. Like, do you remember the dolls in school? It's like, did someone touch you here? Did someone touch you here? Well, you're just allowing it to happen in front of parents' presence. And very often people come to me and say, I think you're a bit harsh and I think you're a bit insensitive. And I, my response to that is because they're a child and children can't protect themselves. Like why, why is this a conversation for grown adults? You don't need to be a scientist or uh, a scholar to know that you should want to protect young minds. There's a reason why we don't allow people to go to war at 12. There's a reason why we don't allow face tattoos at six. There's a reason why we don't allow adult decisions to be made by children's minds because they're not developed. Why is this so hard? So when you're looking at things that show, uh, children sh show signs, obviously very young. I've heard, I've heard from friends of children who ended up being gay later on. And they, you know, very young, they played with dolls. They wanted uh, to wear the dresses. They wanted to do the makeup. They wanted all of these things. Um, and so they never ushered them towards a direction. They just kind of let their kid be the child end up coming out as gay, but we'll, we're not seeing that anymore. We're seeing individuals. It's almost like the, the gay community is slowly disappearing. And it's almost like it is a uh, detriment to you if you are gay to say that you're gay. It's almost like you need to be X, Y, and Z, them, they, whatever. And you need to be bisexual or, or queer. And I'm pretty sure wasn't queer offensive before. So what mm -hmm. I'm not understanding is why all of a sudden have we started seeing less gay individuals and all of a sudden seeing such a huge amount of indiv individuals transitioning in groups of like 10 and 20 
Yeah, I would definitely say that young people especially are incentivized now to pick one of these new labels and to not identify as gay. But actually, just with our previous point, I thought of something in terms of why parents are going along with this is because they get rewarded. If you're a woke mm. parent and you're so happy to bring your kids and show you're so accepting of this ideology, you get rewarded all the way through. And I, I'm sure these mothers who take their kids to these events probably get a warm fuzzy feeling inside that they think that they're doing the right thing maybe they genuinely do think that maybe they're so blinded by ideology that they don't see what's actually in front of them um but in, yeah in some cases you know there are these so-called i mean i just saw an event recently it's like a sex toy themed event it says it's all ages oh like, there, there's no reason as a former sex researcher as one of the most pro do whatever you want <laughs> in the bedroom as long as it's consensual i'm not here to judge anybody you draw the line of kids there's no reason for that it's not appropriate it's it's just not a not good a good direction to go into but in terms of yeah the decreasing number of gay people i mean i hear all the time from gay people that, that say if they were growing up now they're they're concerned that they would be pushed to transition many of them even considered transitioning when they were younger um and but changed their mind i have had a couple of gay men reach out to me specifically and say that they consider transitioning but read my work or saw me speak and decided to wait. And it just, it blows my mind because I, you know, I think sometimes you forget or I, I don't really think about people reading my work. I'm just like, I just put out what I think and I just mm -hmm. hope that it does some good in the world. But it, um, yeah, it's, there is still, I think that there has been a lot done for gay rights. I do think things have gotten better, but more could be done. And I think that residual sentiment of homophobia or anti-gay sentiments in society is still there and there are parents who don't want a gay child so if they have a feminine boy or a masculine girl they are to some extent incentivized to tra transition that child so that if you have a feminine boy who grows up to be attracted to men if he is a girl and grows up to be a woman then it looks like a woman who's attracted to men and the same i would say with masculine girls and especially with what we're seeing with rapid onset gender dysphoria in terms of this huge huge uptick in terms of the number of girls and young women who are suddenly identifying as non-binary or a trans man and they want to transition it comes out of nowhere the parents usually have no idea and usually these girls are very female typical in childhood that is coming from a place of either not liking being sexualized by society in the event that someone is lesbian they're not really comfortable with their sexuality and they think if they like girls that must mean they're actually a man and so there, there are so many other things going on beneath the surface that we should be talking about as a society instead of simply saying, whatever you identify as, we will affirm you, we will prop you up and say, that's wonderful and glorious and brave. There was a study I was looking at recently, it was, I think, 20% of Gen Z identifies as LGBT+. Plus. Well, and I just... I can't believe that, but there are people who actually think that this is due to social acceptance. And I just, it's like you said, it's either women are on average more bisexual just because that's how our sexuality is compared to men. So I think there are more women who are calling themselves bisexual because they don't want to be a boring straight girl. And then <laughs> queer, everyone is again, que quote unquote queer, even though I, I still see that as a slur because that makes you not a cishet enemy, right? So it gives right. you some, some clout. So, yeah, I mean, I, I would say, you know, do identify how you want and experiment however you want. But the fact that it's also associated in many cases with going down this path of medicalization, that's what concerns me because we are seeing the number of detransitioners. I feel like every week there are more and more of these young people coming out saying, I made this mistake. And the fact that they are also being censored and they're being harassed is as a whole other thing. But yeah, I, I just don't see this ending well. Well, it's funny that you say that. I don't see this ending well because it feels like it doesn't even need to end. It's just not going well. It's it's there is no great ending. It this is going and leading down a path of lawsuits, immense amount of lift needed to be done by the psychology and psychiatry community which we already do not have enough of, especially post COVID. It's gonna depend on whether people are going to keep speaking out. It's gonna depend on whether individuals are seeing the light, but I don't think it's a good ending. I don't think it's a good during. I think it's concerning to say the least. I think more and more we are seeing individuals who very often are on the spectrum, right? More than they are trans. 
But because of fixations and things along those lines with that come with autism or spin, you're seeing others, whether on the bottom end or the top end or smack in the middle, but very often, most of the time, doesn't matter where you are on that spectrum, fixation is, is definitely something that happens. And you see that with OCD type children where fixations, it's, it's it happens. So I can see how so many coupled with so many children coupled with social pressures, uh, fixations, undiagnosed autism. I can see how this is happening. I, I can I can wrap my brain around it. But what I can't understand is when we have people who come forward who you can very, this is rude to say, you can tell that this is, we are trying to conform. We are trying to be in this community. We are trying to find ourselves. You can see people coming into this group and saying like, I want to do this because I feel safe in this community. I feel healthy in this community. I feel loved and wanted. But what happens when that individual wakes up one day and goes, you know what? I actually can think critically enough for myself. I've gotten myself out of this social media bubble and this community. What happens to somebody who decides down the road, I don't want to do this anymore and I want to detransition? They're basically disowned by the community. They will lose all their friends. They will lose all of their support in terms of their care team. Um, I would say in terms of the conversations I've had with these transitioners, because the medical community, this is such a new population. I mean, there have been people detransitioning in the past, but not to the extent that we're seeing now. And especially with this newer subtype of young women who are transitioning post puberty, like you said, being on the spectrum, um, in many cases, having a lot of psychological comorbidity, the medical community doesn't know what to do with them. So, I, I, and I think also many professionals feel, many clinicians believe that if someone detransitions, they're at a higher rate of suicide. So they're not going to encourage that or want to even entertain that idea with somebody. So the detransitioners are basically left to their own devices in terms of their social support, in terms of how they're going to move forward in terms of the actual detransition. And then, you know, I, I think also for the families, it's very difficult because the parents, if, I guess it depends on whether the parents were on board with the decision or not. But um, I know I, I get, I hear from so many parents and I would say, if you are skeptical as a parent, especially if your child is over the age of 18, there's only so much you can do, but just to, you know, be as clear as you can, I guess, with how you feel and support your child and be there for them so that if and when this happens, they know they can come back to you. Because my sense is, in many cases, there's a strained relationship between the child and the parent or the family. And no matter how difficult it is, I think it's important for that child to know that they, even if you have a bad relationship, that if things don't work out, they can come back to you. And it's not going to be a situation of, oh, see, I told you so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not going to end well in, in any incident where you have a child that's going to end up staying with us. Because I can tell you right now, from a trauma perspective, being ostracized by a community that, you know, thought trust you, there's, there's repercussions to this that I think the reason I brought that up is because I don't know that others, you don't hear about detransition or so then you don't hear about the repercussions of what that can really mean for someone, their family, their life, and the rest of their existence, the trauma that can become from that can be bad enough all on its own. But that brings me to a, <laughs> this is gosh, jumping around because I know I'm short on time. Autogynophilia. I want to talk about this. <laughs> Listen, I have my questions. All right. I want to talk about Go this because I, I'm not sure if you heard of this story. Uh, there was a Canadian by the name of Russell Williams. We found out afterwards he would keep uh, lingerie from women, dress up in it, and take photos of himself. So does this fall into this category of um, what he would necessarily be diagnosed with? Because I know you've worked with some serious offenders in your life. You you understand what it means to talk to somebody who is looking at science and sexuality from a different perspective when it comes to like healthy sexual behaviors. And then you also know what it means to talk to somebody who does not have self um, healthy sexual behaviors that could be quite dangerous or have propensities to be dangerous. So I want to talk about it from that perspective, if that's okay. Yeah. So okay. autogynophilia, for people who may not have heard this term before, it refers to sexual arousal at the thought of having a woman's body. So this happens in men, uh, people born male. And some people will argue a uh, women experience this too. But if you actually look at the research studies and look at how people with autogynophilia describe their experiences women 
do not get turned on at the thought of putting on their underwear or getting dressed in the morning. So someone with autogynephilia, so a man with this, this experience can in some, in some cases experience orgasm, you know, masturbate at the thought of just getting dressed or, or find it difficult to get dressed in the morning because it's so sexually arousing to put on women's clothing. So other experiences, I mean, sometimes people will find it arousing the, the idea of taking birth control. So they'll fantasize about taking female birth control. I have yet to meet a single woman who finds taking birth control sexually arousing, sexually appealing in any way. No, I don't know any women who masturbate thinking about that. Um, so, it, you know, it's it's very female typical um, roles, or it, in some cases, those roles can be seen as, I would say, sexist or even misogynistic, things like, um, say, doing the laundry, because that's seen as a female typical role. There are some people thought a kind of feeling who found that sexually arousing. And like I said, having the bodily form of a woman, also female physiological uh, processes like lactating and menstruating. Again, I don't know any women who finds lactating or menstruating sexually arousing. So anyway, this is a common phenomenon among some people who choose to transition. So people who are born male identify as female who are sexually attracted to women or both sexes. And this is a big no-no because I, my sense is people who experience this, they probably have a lot of shame that comes along with that. And also from a historical perspective, if they chose to seek medical transition, gatekeeping would have been more difficult for them, as opposed to someone who was, say, born male, always very uh, female typical from a young age, attracted to men. So upon tra that for them, it's not, it's not about sexual arousal. For them, it's more so about the partners that they're interested in attracting. So someone who's born male, attracted to very masculine men, is going to have an easier time attracting masculine men as a woman than as a man. Whereas for some with autogynephilia, on average, tend to be much more male typical. So when they're young, they were into sports, into computers, not that computers is a necessarily male typical thing, but this is just something that we see. And so I would say for people who experience autogynephilia, there's not necessarily a correlation between that and committing sexual offenses. Although I think because there's so little known about it and it's so so taboo to talk about it, people immediately, and I'm not, I'm not saying you do this, but I think in the public can tend to assume the absolute worst and say okay so if this person finds it it's a it's a fetish for them then where does does that mean that they're also going to be preying on women they want to go into women's spaces to spy on them that's not necessarily true i would say as from what we've been seeing in terms of some of the convicted sex offenders who do go into women's spaces yes that is why they are there but that's not necessarily always the case with some with autogynephilia there are many people in society who experience this who and transition may or may not actually help them. So some people don't even transition. They live as male and they just indulge in this in these fantasies in their in their personal lives. Um, but I think there is more of a push now for especially young men who are realizing this about themselves. They go online and they are being told that they have these feelings. This must mean that they're trans and they should transition when I, I question whether that will actually be the right choice for them. But autogynephilia is very similar in some ways to cross-dressing. So like you're saying, um it is a paraphilia it's an unusual sexual preference paraphilia so that's the word yes. i was looking for god you couldn't have helped a brother out here come on <laughs> oh i'm sorry i was i had that word at the tip of my tongue i was like i knew it i knew oh, there it was but it, it's not that i would brought it up in order to be shameful towards it i brought it up because that was the very first time when i was in college after i got out of the military i went through a criminology program and they said listen we're gonna look at a host of different serial killers you guys can pick who you want. This was right after it happened. He is from my town. And this was something that was discovered going through as they started to find things in his home and all these different places. And that was something that stunned me. I had never been exposed to that before. I didn't understand that as being a paraphilia or a fetish or whatever you want to call it. So that was the first time I had ever witnessed it. It kind of stuck with me. I was like, okay, this is, there's, this is different. And that's what I like about you. You kind of, throughout this book, whether people realize it or not, as much as you are being an advocate for individuals, you're also kind of exposing others to different types of worlds that do happen all around us. But we're so blind to because one, we either feel too shameful to have conversations about they're in communities, but they're very quiet communities. And I think it's important to have the conversation because this is something that you are feeling. There is shouldn't be shame towards anything with your body, sexuality. But I think it starts to that starts to take a back seat when other things are brought forward, like with this individual in particular. So there was no, 
not trying to throw any sort of shade towards people who have that tendency. It's just more of a, that was my first type of exposure to that paraphilia. Yeah. So paraphilias are one of my uh, areas of expertise when I was in academia. And what I, I mean, it's basically like sexual kinks, but mm -hmm. what I love is there are just so many of them and you can really never get bored learning about them. And I just, yeah, it's no. really interesting because I'm sure you share the same fascination I, I had with, you know, why do people do these things? Some people do some really, really awful, awful things. Yes. And when you understand a little bit of the, the mentality that they have and also patterns of behavior, it, it makes you see the world in a different way. I think in some ways, in good ways. For me, I chose to leave the field just because I found it was, it was too much. It was too emotionally uh, difficult after a while because it really does take its toll on you. No, I, can, I can imagine so. I mean, especially with the way of the world right now, it's not like you're studying this where this wasn't a public conversation and you weren't going to get canceled for calling somebody a, a he or a she, which mm -hmm. I got to say, I did listen to your episode with, uh, is it Kara Dansky? She is... Mm -hmm. uh, vicious. That woman is no joke. Uh, I, I respect a lot of what she has to say. And I think one of the things that uh, really drew me to that conversation was women in sports. Um, I'm not sure how in depth of a child athlete you were or what your uh, activities were like, but for me, I was, a. that's all I did. I was an athlete. I was a fighter for my entire, up until 19. That's all I did. Just kicked people in the face. And so the idea of uh, a male coming into a Taekwondo tournament with us and us oh, having Taekwondo to too? till about my last fight was just right before I turned 20 at the U S open. And I got my face kicked in and I realized really yeah. quickly, if you don't make weight, you have to move up a category. And I had never not made weight before anyway, long and short. I just decided getting kicked in the head. Wasn't a good part of my job anymore. Um, but in sports, we are seeing, a whole, this is something, this is like a hill I'm willing to die on kind of situation. So I really do want to discuss it seriously because there are major repercussions to individuals who go through puberty, transition afterwards and jump into contact sports, any type of sport with a woman. And I don't believe it should be accepted. And somehow it's being accepted. How, how, how do we move forward? How do we move forward as a society without having something along the lines of like a third category? I mean, I would be in favor of a third category, but the problem with activists is they are not happy with anything ex unless it is absolutely what they demand. And for them, equality means exactly the same. So, I mean, just from a scientific perspective, this idea that if you take feminizing hormones that that somehow overrides the advantages associated with male puberty that is just not true uh, anyone who watches these competitions i think i mean if you're operating in reality i don't know how you can deny that there is an advantage so initially i i would say i would have said we should be really vocal about this i still think so but honestly, I think this is just going to do itself in. Mm -hmm. I don't think most people are okay with this. I, if Of all of the subjects I covered in my book, this one is the one that people seem to be the least afraid of saying, yes, I agree with you on this. Even really? the childhood transition thing, people were a little, I, I mean, when I first started writing about this, it was really taboo to, to, to talk about this and to counter that narrative. But I would say with sports, that was one that people just write out and said, this is, that is not fair. There's no way that is fair. I don't need to be a scientist to tell you that's not fair. So this, I, we see more organizations pushing back. I think that's a good thing. We see more female athletes speaking up. I think that's a good thing. And yeah, I, I think it's unfortunate because this is one issue that, if anything, I think puts people off of trans rights because they think that the average everyday trans person is in favor of these crazy ideas and they're not. And I have so many trans people who tell me that they think they're like trans women, so-called trans women in prisons, they're not okay with so called trans women in women's sports, they're not okay with even children transitioning. So I really, I do think this issue hopefully very soon is going to come around because it's totally insane at this point. Well, it's heartbreaking to watch only because you've got individuals who go to universities with the hopes of becoming a professional athlete. They, they get into these, this, you know, their whole life is built around training. If you're an athlete and you're really going to do anything with it, that's all you do. That's all you think about. That's it. Your whole life is built around doing this. And 
if you've got four years to be seen at a major school and this happens to be the time that you're trying to do anything, it's heartbreaking to watch women's sports being wiped off the, the face of the earth because that's how it feels. I'm hopeful that this will take a pause and maybe revert backwards a little bit because, you know, the bell, it does. Everything does swing back. We understand that. But for some, they might be caught in that really unlucky time where the reason you're not going to get to move forward and what you've always dreamed of is because of activists like this. I, I'm just trying to understand, hey humans, I know you've all been seeing me drink HVMN's Ketone IQ lately. This is a game changer. Jet fuel in a bottle. I use Ketone IQ for everything in my life, whether it's running, cycling, podcasting, or just the extra boost that my brain needs. I won't lie, it helps push me to the next level in all things. I love Ketone IQ and what HVMN stands for. Go grab some shots today at HVMN.com and use the code BRASS20 and save. Why people find it's so unacceptable to talk about children transitioning, men walking into women's bathrooms, um, why, why sex offenders who are male can go into prison cells with other women. Is this just a Canada thing? Is this something that's happening everywhere? Is this something we need to be concerned about from a long-term basis? Yeah, it's unfortunately not just in our country. I <laughs> see it happening in the US, it's happening in the UK. Um, there was a really prominent case in Scotland recently of, so Scotland has since reversed their policy. They put a pause on this, but they were allowing offenders convicted in some cases sex offenders who identifies female to be housed in women's prisons and so we saw two prominent cases there's one person who was housed so this is a convicted double rapist oh, who was okay. housed in a women's prison um, due to public outcry was moved back to male prison so this person was um hello yeah I'll, I'll leave it at that and then the other person okay. was convicted of stalking a, uh, an underage girl also wanted to be transferred to a female prison and then due to public outcry, that didn't happen. So they, Scotland, for the time being, has paused this and said, no, we're not allow allowing people with a history of violent or sexual offenses against women to be transferred to women's prisons. Uh, I, Again, this is another situation where I'm just dumbfounded. I don't know how this was ever happening in, in Canada. I mean, this has been happening since 2018 in terms of prioritizing gender self-identification over biological sex, over physical anatomy, and for anyone who has any course of sexual interests or any sexual offenses, especially against women or gir and girls, why would you not think that it's a bad idea to put them around more potential victims? I just, I don't understand how wokeism and the activists have intimidated people to such an extent. And I think it's because the people who are making these policies are not the ones who actually have to bear out the consequences of them. And so they can walk around and say, oh, I'm virtuous. I advocated for being on the quote unquote right side of history, but they don't have to live in terror and fear every day of being victimized. And I think on some level people, even the most compassionate people just don't really think about what happens in prison. Prison is not a, a nice place. And I, I think that also that separation allows people to just not, I mean, I've had so many conversations with people and I'm just amazed because they'll say like, oh, I don't really think, I don't really, the prison issue doesn't really bother me. I mean, you know, and it's, it's weird. It's like, I've been critical of feminism, but all of the things I've been seeing happening make me question whether I'm going to be a feminist again, because I just think like, how is this happening? This should not be happening in this day and age. And it's just, why don't people care? It's just mind boggling. But no, there's gender ID policies. I am sympathetic to the fact that yes, in some cases, trans women who are probably a little bit more feminine are going to be a target in male prisons. But again, have a, a separate wing for them, have a separate, uh, put them in, in isolation. You don't put them in a women's prison. Yeah, I mean, there are solutions to this problem. We find it, uh, again, when I went through that degree, we had to go visit a bunch of prisons. Okay, that was weird. Uh, we walked through, open, just out. Hey, what's up, everybody? We're all within touching range. Anybody, anybody wanna just fuck around and find out? Because they walked us through these prisons. <laughs> with serial Not killers pleasant. and rapists <laughs> and i'm just like a college kid here walking <laughs> and these people are 
at least this prison I went to, they had their own washing machines. They had their own TVs that had HBO. They had all of these <laughs> things. And I'm going to myself like, okay, so if this is what tax dollars are paying for, um, you think that the least they could do is maybe just take some of the money they put towards like these ridiculous things that they shouldn't have, that most people who live outside of prison don't have. And they should make a wing that should be for individuals who are vulnerable. Because at the end of the day, there are vulnerable people in our societies. And yes, they still do things that require them to be housed in a penitentiary. But the least that you could be doing, and I'll never advocate for solitary. There is solutions to this, but putting predators, and I'm going to call any rapist predator, I think that's a fair assessment, to never be locked into a cage with somebody for, you know, eight to 10 hours a night uh, when they're not allowed out. I mean, no woman should be put in that position. Now, I will say, and I think, actually, I don't know how you feel about this. So I'd be curious to hear your stance on this. How do you feel if somebody has had full bottom surgery where they, you know, like, because that's where the line is for me, maybe that's wrong, but I think the line for me on a lot of these issues is does the individual, has they, have they taken the medical transition all the way through? My general approach is for any of these cases, it really should be on a case by case assessment. Mm -hmm. So when someone comes in or whatever, you know, you determine, do they actually suffer from gender dysphoria? How many st stages of transition were they undergoing prior to? being arrested prior to conviction. So some people could say, well, maybe someone was transitioning uh, in anticipation of being arrested for their conviction. But I think that would speak a little bit more so to someone genuinely experiencing these this issue as opposed to just latching onto it. Because even if they aren't a sex offender, just having an easier time in a, in a women's prison because they're not gonna be fearing for their life because the women are not gonna be as strong as incarcerated men. So even even female inmates, I mean, um, in terms of the surgery aspect, I mean, I I would still say in prison, someone who is born male is, is probably physically going to still be larger than the average woman. But again, I think that would help their case in terms of being a little bit more understandable versus taking someone who was male the entire way through the process put into a men's prison and then just somehow magically realize that he's female this whole time yeah no i would i would tend to agree i think they're if somebody is actively transitioning prior to being arrested i think there's more to that than them just anticipating being arrested i don't think anybody anticipates trying to be arrested and put away for prison for life it rings a little different and the only reason i say that is because at what point do we start allowing individuals to truly transition into the the, the gender they want to be. Um, if they've taken all of the steps, they've done all of the hormones, they've lived as a woman, they've fully transitioned their entire body. I mean, at some point, I feel like there has to be a line where it's like, okay, you're ready to rock. The world accepts you as that. I think you should be allowed to be in women's spaces, whether that is uh, everyone's belief or not. But I think at some point there should be like, yeah, of course you've done, say so you've done the work, you've done the work. You should get that opportunity to be fully accepted as that. But I, and I, I do not accept this. I do not accept if you have a penis, you can walk around uh, women's change rooms where there's vulnerable individuals. I, I don't accept that. And I think people think that's hateful. But at what point do we start protecting the people who get raped a lot? <laughs> mm -hmm. When do we start caring here about what it means to be a woman in a space? I, I mean, am I missing something? Well, especially when you look at what's happening with locker rooms, and there was one prominent case in San Diego with a minor girl who, she was basically in tears. She was at the city council talking about this, saying she was in a locker room, came out of the shower, and she said she saw a nude male, and she went to complain about it, and the staff told her that person is allowed to be there. And that person has since come out and said, oh, you know, I'm a trans woman, I should be allowed. But if this minor, I mean, could recognize that this person was not born female, and she presumably was not that close to the person. I, I just, why are we not caring about girls and women and their safety? And especially in situations like that, where there are plenty of children who are using these facilities, you know, I don't know. <laughs> even, even my son, like, for example, my son is almost seven. Okay. Even when we go to a restaurant, I'll be like, you come in with mommy. No, I don't. I'm not going in there. I'm not. Girls are in there, mommy. I'm not going in there. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm not. So then my husband will take him into the male bathroom and, and whatever they do their thing. My, my point in saying that is 
I just, I, I guess I lost understanding where our society stopped caring about the people that were vulnerable and only started caring about the grown adults that can't seem to control their own emotions, wants, and needs over the mm. needs, wants, and protection of children. Yeah. I mean, I think many of the people pushing this are, it, it really is about their own self-acceptance probably I don't think they're very happy people and so the way that they're going to try and bring about their happiness or their self-acceptance is to just force it on everyone else to any extent possible but the fact that we actually do have law and policy going along with this now is is unbelievable because that's that's where I mean I didn't think I'd see that happen but here we are I didn't see I didn't think I'd see a lot of things happen but you know here we are anyway Children, though, in my opinion, are our most vulnerable. And the fact that we are telling parents that it is, would you rather, I, I love that how you said this, and I, I've heard it before, but would you rather, uh, was it a dead son and a live daughter? Mm -hmm. um, it's really troubling to me from a perspective of uh, saying that somebody will uh, die by suicide if you don't allow them to do the thing that they want to do. That to me sounds like a uh, well, unresolved trauma and uh, behavior issues that we normally only give into uh, children. The thing that I don't like the most is I take uh, a lot of, I get really sensitive around suicide, mainly because of the community I am in where we lose 44 people a day and no one seems to care about that. But um, what I what I really struggle with is when somebody says, if you don't do this, that child will die by suicide. Do you find it dangerous to be saying these types of things to parents and threatening almost that your child will for sure die by suicide versus sitting down and going, maybe there's some other trauma we need to have a conversation about. I do think there are many parents who are going along with this who are understandably terrified. And I mean, any I'm not a parent, but I imagine if someone says to you that if your child does not do X, that child is at a high risk of suicide, that you would do whatever it takes to make sure that your child is safe. And the fact that with these kids, especially, there are so many other issues that are going on that should be talked about, especially in a therapeutic setting. If you don't address those things, even if they transition, those issues are still going to be there after transitioning. And they're, they're going to have to work on them at some point in their life. Um, probably going to end up detransitioning because they realize that 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 didn't help to make them feel better and so i think it is really inappropriate that this narrative exists but you hear it all the time it's very very widespread and and especially the fact that from so many of these young people they have a history of sexual trauma that's something that needs to be talked about also and so many detransitioners have told me this i would say almost every single one has had this experience either in childhood or upon reaching puberty and i just you know, the, the, it's so important that they get the help and the support that they need so that they feel better, legitimately feel better. This is what it should actually be about. It should be about helping these young people who are, I think, legitimately struggling with something. They need to get the appropriate care so that they feel better. And it's not just about slapping on some some treatment that is socially acceptable right now or trendy right now to allow, allow them to do whatever they want with their bodies and to, to say that we're doing the right thing and yeah it's it's not it's not going to be good it's not um we're seeing it bleed into schools we touched on soji before but uh i saw this morning before we had our conversation today i saw that Ch a chilliwack school is now having um a ton of transition slash sex ed books accessible to all the way down to kindergarten. I know because my son also came home with one last year and it promptly never went back to the school. And then it sparked a conversation with the principal and the teachers. Um, the thing that I'm most scared of, and I'm hopeful that maybe you'll put this at ease for me. Do you think that the school boards are ever going to realize what they're doing before we go to the point where I would say the trauma that comes from this starts to show. I unfortunately I don't think the ship is going to turn around until that point. Sadly, I, if you had asked me this a year or two ago, I might have been a little bit more optimistic about it. But I think there people are too invested at this point, and and I I also think because it's being sold as the right thing to do, the compassionate thing to do, and any questioning of that is immediately labeled as hateful. If you're just, 
I don't, I can't really speak for these educators in terms of where they are, but my sense is, especially if you've gone through the education system, you've gone to university, you've been indoctrinated with these ideas, this, this is your value system. In some cases, I think they are doing this in, behind parents' backs. We see this happening because they genuinely think that this is the right thing to do for these children. And yes, there are some parents who maybe are not as comfortable with a child who is gay or say with transgender adults, but I don't believe it is ever a person's place to go behind a parent's back and to quote unquote affirm a child or to let them use new pronouns or whatever and do this and not tell the parent. So I think I think until the lawsuits, I mean, we see so many lawsuits happening now, that's really what it's going to take because I, I think people who are pushing this and who have um, who are going along with this are are just too deep in the indoctrination. They they do not see what what's really happening. Fair enough. Well, every grown adult will be getting your book for Christmas this year because <laughs> I feel like I need some people to understand. I feel like people, the more they get to know you, the more they read a, your your column and not only your book, but your column and your your constant work on trying to get others to understand what the heck is going on in this world. How do we work through this and not from a hateful perspective, but from a, a place of genuine compassion and empathy and wanting every human being to be happy in their life because we only have one of these and we're all going through this human experience. So why do we need to make it harder on any more of us? It's hard enough living in this planet right now. We should just try to make it easier for everyone, but making it easier does not mean caving to this dangerous ideology that I believe truly is only going to harm a lot of very confused youth because based off what I read in your book, based off what I went through, if I was a teenager nowadays, the way that I acted, walked, talked, dressed, looked like, I would not be Kelsey right now. And I that makes me sad because that means that I would have lost out on what it means to be this person in this world in the goals and the dreams that I have, not the ones that I was told that I should have because I have short hair, listen to Eminem, wear snap pants and only do Taekwondo. So I <laughs> love the snap pants. <laughs> oh my God. Those tearaways were life. <laughs> I know you know about those tearaways. I know you know. No, I do. I do. <laughs> oh my goodness, gracious lady. I am really uh, grateful for your time and for the work that you're doing. And I hope to have you back on so I can pull apart a lot of these, uh, a lot of these topics with you because I think this is just a small overview for others to learn from and hopefully find some hope from, uh, let them know that they're not alone in this journey and that there are others like us out there that just want to see people be safe and do well in this world. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me. And I look forward to speaking with you again. Amazing. Can you tell everyone where they can go and get a copy of your book, listen to the audio and support whatever you're doing with your work? Yes, you can go to Um, The audiobook is free on Audible. Uh, you can also go to Simon & Schuster's website. And then I'm on social media at Dr. Deborah So. Thank you so much, darling. You stick with me. Everyone else, we'll see you all next week.